Well, hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is published every other week. If you are a painter who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, and how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million and a half times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community. You'll be inspired to create and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community, but make sure that you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. This week on the Savvy Painter Podcast, I talk with Therese Morgan. For all you painters out there who have big audacious ideas you want to get off the ground, you are going to love this conversation. Therese and her friend Mark David are painters after my own heart. While hanging out and having coffee, they came up with an idea for a little plein air painting project. They were both sort of in a creative rut and they wanted a project to pull them out of it. So without any prior backpacking experience, Therese and Mark figured out what they would need, got funding, packed their gear, and hiked the 220 miles of the John Muir Trail in the Sierra Nevadas. Their story resonated with me for several reasons, but mostly because I love backpacking. But the planning and the pure passion leading up to their expedition reminded me of a lot of my own two-year painting expedition in Argentina. All the careful thought-out detailed plans are invaluable and necessary, but you still have to be ready to pivot when the unexpected happens, big and small. For Therese, that was things like weather, broken gear, and, you know, we had a lot of fires in California that year. Therese and Mark had plenty of reasons to back out, but their passion and desire to turn this project into a reality and finish it won out. So here is Therese Morgan to tell you her story. Therese, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm excited to talk to you with today. Me too. Tell me a little bit about how you started painting. Yeah, so I kind of felt backwards in the painting I was leaning more towards psychology and then I did a internship in Zambia actually with an art therapist and so I started heading that direction which is a master's degree so I was like well my undergrad I'll do painting so I went to an art school and the first semester my progress reports were C's and D's and I was overwhelmed and I just kind of put everything into it and couple of years later, it was my life. It kind of just sort of happened that way. So because you were getting bad grades, you kind of doubled down and well, bad grades, you were getting C's. That's not actually bad grades, but you decided to double down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then just seeing the progress or just getting excited, the community, it just sort of like everything grew and sort of put away that idea of going to pursue a master's. So what did you decide to do instead then? What did you, like, how was that decision for you? Was it scary or was it just kind of, this is what I'm going to do? It was a little scary. And I think that my path as an artist has been more of a failing forward type of situation and like constantly sort of stumbling along. Right outside of school, I had several solo shows lined up and other things and it was just kind of like a whirlwind and everything was sort of snowballing and then I kind of crashed and I I lost that momentum and I kept like wiping things out or throwing them away and so this project that I did last year the brush miles project where I hiked the John Muir Trail was sort of like a my friend and I were just like having coffee in Oakland and kind of coming to terms that we'd both sort of hit that kind of rut as painters and felt that we needed to do something different and challenge ourselves. So this is kind of me rebooting, I guess. Yeah. Let's go back to when you left school, you started to cut out just a little bit. So what was going on when you 
sort of ha- felt like you were starting to go into that rut. Like you left school and you were having some success. And can you describe what happened next? You know, a lot of artists have that situation where you're studying, 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 and then you finally get out, you get a couple shows. It's a weird feeling at that point, because you're not really, sh- you're still kind of new at it, you're not really sure what's gonna happen. So I'd love for you to paint a picture of what was happening and how you were feeling during that time. Yeah, and that's something that I've like, in hindsight, sort of analyzed many times in the last couple years. So when I was in school, it was my life. I was there from 8 a.m. to midnight almost every day, using the studios there also to do work. And I had shows that I was participating in while I was in school and then super overloaded my schedule after school. Then I was super blown away. I was selected as one of the valedictorian nominees for school, which kind of was exciting, but also like very, somehow I I went more towards the like pressure or stress response of that. And I just kind of wanted to like stay with that par a little bit and um, be a quote unquote real artist. So I living in the Bay Area with all the expenses that come with that, I decided to be a full-time artist where it was where all my money was coming from. And thank God I had these initial successes where I was selling and stuff like that, or else I'd be under a bridge. But I didn't even have another job. And so I think it was just this like pile of expectations from other people. Like during school, there's sort of a safety net under you where like if something you're not liking something or whatever, you're like, oh, well, it was a school project. Or, you know, like, there's so many excuses. But like, the second I graduated, everyone was asking, well, what are you going to paint now that you're a real artist or whatever? And like, I didn't feel like I had my voice yet, or my way of painting yet, or my even what I wanted to paint, or what I wanted to say as an artist, like all these kinds of things. And like, it sort of felt like you couldn't win a little bit too. Like people, either somebody was painting something that no one's going to buy. Why are they painting that? Or the thing was, oh, they're just painting what people are going to buy. Like that's so lame. Or like, you know, whatever, like any direction you went, there was something to say. And then the anxiety of future bills and the social seclusion that I kind of put myself in. I rented a studio and I didn't realize I struggled so much with time management, but you know, like when you're in school or you have a job or all these things, they force these kind of time limits on you, right? But without any structure, I would be there in the morning, I'd stay late, but I'd just be there all the time. And I wasn't seeing my friends anymore. Everything just kind of piled. I don't know. And <laughs> It fell apart. (laughs) I can totally picture that. (laughs) I'm guessing that a lot of people who will be listening to this or who are listening to this are nodding their heads vigorously. I would love to hear from you, though. You've got all these questions. I mean, you said this, and most artists feel this, but I would love to hear from you. What does it mean to you personally to be a quote-unquote real artist? I think that art provides a way to see the world. And I think perception is very fascinating. And, you know, we can all be in the same world, same city, same community, whatever, experiencing the same things, going to the same events and coming home and telling a different story, right? And I feel like art provides a way to see somebody else's experience of the world placed in front of you on a canvas. So you get to walk up to it and see what somebody else is seeing. And I think that's really cool. That's a great answer. I love that. Has it taken you time to come to that, that realization? I'm just kind of curious if you felt that way when you graduated, or if that is something that you've sort of come to a conclusion to after doing these, these projects that you've been doing. Yeah, I think that it's been a little bit of both. And it was a question that 
maybe in the last two years of school and then these last couple years afterwards has been asked over and over with fellow artists, especially with people outside the arts trying to understand what I'm doing, right? And I would fluctuate from what I felt or feeling that I needed to like completely bear myself as an individual and and lay out the most personal aspects of myself or something. And And I think that is very beautiful and has a place, but I think it definitely has evolved. And I think from um, having those conversations from myself painting and sort of seeing what I was painting or even just going to shows and seeing what other people are painting and just kind of realizing that art runs the gamut, right? But I think as long as there's an honesty and just kind of a view into what you're seeing or feeling or or as long as your art is a representation of something honest that is from your view, I guess. I love getting like the full picture. So forgive me for digging in. When you were in that, uh, let's just call it your isolation mode. And I don't know if you saw me kind of smiling, but I did the exact same thing where I did it after after I quit Disney. And I was like, yay, freedom, I get to work on whatever I want. This is gonna be like, I'm just gonna like, dominate. Oh, I it was be great. Yeah. yeah. It was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I want to hear about that. Tell me about that. I'll tell you what um, what I experienced just so you don't feel like you're the only one. I guarantee you this is a thing. So why was it a mistake for you? It was a mistake, I think, because I lost that sense of community that I had and lost that, like, you know, we were all painting. We were all very serious in our own right, me and my friends or me and my classmates. But I think just being next to each other, sharing a studio together kind of pushed you forward, egged you forward, or during breaks, having those conversations, debating things, staring at all our favorite artists. It it kind of created an environment that was conducive to art that I didn't realize I needed. I saw the things that I didn't like about it when I just wanted some space or when most of my art has some bad stages in between from like, oh, I'm so excited to, to, oh my God, to, oh, I like it. And during the, oh my God stage, I kind of don't want anyone else in the studio, right? So, so I saw all these reasons why I didn't like the shared space, but going to the opposite extreme was, uh, had its own challenges and was maybe the wrong choice. For sure. I can totally understand that. I think I've, I feel like I've had this experience three times where human beings, like we have such an amazing ability to forget (laughs) what things are like, you know, what the reality is. So when I was in school, same thing, having that community around you, you take it for granted. So those in between conversations, those like kind of cleansing of your palate of just like, walking out of your studio to go get a coffee with somebody and have enough of a distraction that you completely, it just like hits the reset button for you a little bit. And those tiny little reset buttons are more important, I think, than we understand. And just having people around you who are working on a similar thing is incredibly inspiring and motivating. And so when you don't have that, when you don't have these people that are in the trenches with you, and you get to those moments, like you said, where the painting's not going so well that day, where you're a little bit frustrated, and you don't have either the break, or even if it's it's not necessarily about commiserating, but just that little refresh of walking into somebody else's studio and seeing what they're working on, even if you don't even mention the fact that you're frustrated and seeing somebody else really progressing or, you know, struggling or whatever it is that they're doing with their own work is sort of like, okay, this isn't unusual. There's nothing wrong with me. I can do this. 
So I think, yeah, all that stuff is, is super important. And I underestimated it not once, not twice, but three times. (laughs) So (laughs) I think that's, I think that's part of like our, our ability to forget because for artists, we're so stereotypically, I have a theory on why this is such a stereotype and why I think it's true, but we'll ignore that for now. But stereotypically, artists tend to be more introverted. They tend to be okay with being by themselves. And I think we kind of all have uh, sometimes this fantasy of, oh my God, if I could just go to a cabin and paint and nobody would (laughs) interrupt me, like I could totally be a hermit and like, I would be so happy. And it is so not true. Like I always think like, oh, if it weren't for like all these interruptions, I would be able to make huge progress with my work. And then I get that. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. This is too much. Like you totally, (laughs) it's like you totally panic. I think that is a very common fantasy that artists have of, I just want to be by myself and work. And there's somewhere there's a balance in there. And it's probably a range and different from most people about how much interaction they actually need. But I think we all need it. Yes. Learning the hard way. There's no other way. I will agree. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes that's the only way to learn. So you you were in that stage and kind of struggling along. So now I want to dig into like what the John Muir trail came in. I have had my own intense research on both both the Pacific Crest Trail and the Appalachian Trail. So like I can totally <laughs> like I don't think there's anything that you're going to say that is going to, for me is going to be like, "Oh wow, she's weird for thinking that." <laughs> right. Yeah, well, living in California, it's where I went to school and I stayed there a couple years after. And obviously, like just loving the outdoors there, going to hike and stuff like that. And so the John Muir Trail was on my bucket list. But anyway, so I was sitting over coffee with my friend Mark David in Oakland. And we just kind of came to that realization that we had both we were in that rut. We weren't liking what we were painting or we weren't making painting enough of a priority. And we were just stuck. Something had to be done. We just kind of threw out this idea, like, what if we hiked the John Muir Trail and we brought our paint supplies along the way and we painted plain air through the trip? And, you know, we laughed about it, how ludicrous it was or whatever. I mean, so much so because we weren't even backpackers. Like it was just like, really, yeah, no, we're not. We weren't backpackers, so it was just completely outrageous. Oh, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> yeah, we just kind of laughed over it and we left it at that. But you know, there's a long history, of course, of people sort of turning to the woods to seek clarity, I guess, or to challenge themselves. And so over the weeks, that just kind of like settled with us. And this crazy idea turned into something that we realized we both needed. We needed to push ourselves. And I think for two reasons. One was this idea that a mutual instructor of ours would always say all the time, this idea of brush miles, of painting all the time, putting in the miles as a painter. Mm Mm-hmm which we weren't doing anymore. And then also something I've always remembered, even though I don't remember the artist who said it, but paraphrasing of something like, you can't have life in your paintings without living life. No true artist can be in their studio all day is basically the idea. And of course, that's what I was doing. And so we sort of realized that we needed to put in those brush miles and we needed to actually experience what we were painting And so we were just kind of shooting for the stars a little bit and decided to, to really shake things up and do something crazy, I guess. Awesome. Okay. So (laughs) I used to backpack a lot and I went on um, a 90 day expedition in Patagonia where like there was no civilization for 90 days. So you go to Patagonia, you got to go, you've got to go. All right. You're sitting in a cafe and you're like, ha ha, wouldn't this be funny? Oh my, wait. Oh my God. This is 
a good idea, but it's insane. And I'm sure there are moments <laughs> of, should we? No, we can't. That's impossible. But I can't stop thinking about it. So should we? So right. um, <laughs> story of my life. Okay, so you're sitting there in a the cafe. Neither one of you are backpackers. You decide you want to do the John Muir Trail. So first off, the John Muir, for people who don't live in California and have no idea what we're talking about, give a quick overview of the John Muir Trail for people who've never heard of it but need to go now. <laughs> you definitely need to go. It is a section of the Pacific Crest Trail, which runs from Mexico to Canada. The John Muir Trail is a stretch in the Sierra Nevadas from Mount Whitney up to um, Yosemite. How long is it? 120, 150 miles ish? Am I near the? It's 220 miles. 220 miles. So you're looking, you're sitting there in the cafe or later on, you guys are talking about it and you're going to do the 220 miles of the John Muir trail. What were the next conversations? What did you, how did you guys convince yourself to do this? Okay, so the biggest thing, which, like I said, it was already a bit of a dream of mine, but there's quite a lot of logistics that are involved. So people typically who are hiking normally spend two to three weeks on the trail. You can do it quicker, but that's like the usual span of time. We were there for 27 days which was quite outrageous. And so also, how can we find basically a month of time that we're both free and that we can get the permits for? So we kind of like, we were like, you know what? We'll shoot out our schedules. We'll see where they line up. And we'll throw our hat in the ring because it's a little bit of a lottery to even get the permit because so many people want to go to that trail. So we just kind of applied I guess and knowing that we might not get it anyway you know so there was not too much pressure of course we got it which was amazing and awesome but then and then kind of like fighting both of us like over the months we'd like check in like hey you're you're not doing anything in September still right or like you know whatever because like we had to make sure ourselves to keep that month open and make sure the other person wasn't Didn't flaking, you know? Yeah, like, please don't flake. Were you ever secretly hoping that it wouldn't go through? So it'd just be kind of like, okay, well, the gods have, like, basically taken that option away. Okay, la, 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 back to my normal life. Right. Yeah, it was a little bit of that. <laughs> or, like, yeah, or even that Mark would follow through, you know, <laughs> He is awesome. But, you know, there was a lot of trust on both sides that we weren't going to do like the traditional millennial flake. And then that summer, there were crazy wildfires surrounding Yosemite. Um, so then that was, you know, I was kind of like on the edge of my seat. That was a month or two before we were going to start hiking. And so this was last summer, last year that you did this. Yeah, that was bad. So I lived in Mammoth and you It'd be like you're sitting in your house and you can't see to the other side of the backyard because there's so much smoke from those fires. Yeah, I was checking the news all the time. I was sure things were going to fall through, that the whole trail was going to be on fire or whatever. So, yeah, there was a lot of, is this going to happen? Right. And as people who don't backpack, that didn't freak you out that there was these massive, like, basically like the biggest wildfires in California history. And you're like, yeah, let's do it. Right. I will admit that I have a tendency in my life to try things that are a little beyond me. You know, <laughs> people call me brave, but I think I run the line between brave and stupid, you know, somewhere in the middle there. So yeah, it was Maybe not the smartest move, but I just kind of wanted to go for it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even own a backpack. Oh my I God, this is hilarious. Before. <laughs> yeah, no, it was nuts. I literally, the first day, was trying to figure out the stove. Uh huh. 
<laughs> Wait, the first day on the trail, you didn't figure that out before you left? I mean, I thought I had. <laughs> I did it once on my kitchen floor, of course, right? So I was like, oh, yeah, I got this. This is good. This is fine. And then the first day, I was like, all right, I'll make dinner. Don't worry. And it wasn't working. And yeah, it was such a panic moment of, <laughs> oh my goodness. It was, yeah, a roller coaster. <laughs> I am sure. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love this. Have you ever read uh, Bill Bryson's book, A Walk in the Woods? Actually, no, I haven't. You need to read that. Basically, the author and a buddy of his decide to do the Appalachian Trail, and they have no experience, and they just go for it. The other character in the book, so it's a true story, obviously, but he was basically a couch potato and pretty overweight. Oh, gosh. Basically, his exercise up until the decision to do this trip was like, get up and go to the fridge and walk from the car to the store. You know, that was it. <laughs> and so these guys go on this trip. So you should read that book. It's funny. It'll make you want to go on the Appalachian Trail. I will definitely read it. And that's not an accurate representation of Mark. But I was more saying both of us were very likely to flake at that moment. Yeah, because you're <laughs> like, this is a big deal. And there's a lot of like, for you guys, I'm sure it's a lot of unknowns. And you're were you like imagining like what could happen or like what your alternatives were? Yeah, so it was just another example of what seems to happen over and over where I have these like ideas of what's going to happen and then there's what really happens, right? So, of course, the plan was to do trips beforehand and to prepare and to, you know, have everything figured out. But there was just never anyone who wanted to backpack or who fit my schedule or Turns out backpacking material is really expensive. I didn't even have the money for the equipment. So everything just kind of like was going crazy. We ended up doing a Kickstarter actually because we were both like, we can't do this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, you had so many reasons to back out. I mean, there's exactly. so many reasons for you guys not to do it. What made you do it? I think that we both kind of dug in our heels because everything builds right in life in a positive way or a negative way. When you flake on something, then you develop patterns in life. And once you flake on one little thing, then something else comes up. It's easier to flake again and things just sort of snowball, right? You develop these habits in life and we'd already created habits that weren't working you know that we weren't we were in that rut like I was saying so we just kind of had to hold each other accountable in all these little hiccups that happened and be like you know what if we're trying to shift course here in our creative lives then we can't flake like we have to whatever happens push through and just finish it I guess and even if like it's a disaster at least we did it right and we'll stumble forward and make some amount of progress I don't know we just felt like we had to do it yep I love it I think that most art projects most of these bold crazy audacious ideas that we have so much of the success of it comes from the planning and what happens ahead of time and that your mental state as you go into it. So that's why I'm asking so many questions about like, well, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? Like what was, sure, what was yeah. you know? <laughs> so now I'd love to hear about the trip itself. So let's just start by day one. You guys are, I'm assuming starting at Whitney. Yeah. So we, we went North. We started at Whitney portal. Okay. And you're at the foot of the trail. What was going through your mind? What did you think was about to happen over the next 20 something days? Oh, my goodness. We had, we were very naive the first day. We of course you were. <laughs> of course. You know, we had an early morning. We woke up at like four or so in the morning. 
we were in LA that morning. Mark's brother very generously offered to drive us. And we actually went that morning to our first resupply point and physically dropped off the buckets. We had these five gallon buckets that had all of our, you know, next supply of food or more important things like white paint and canvas and such. So we handed that off and then we got everything set for our permits. Real quick, I just want to explain to people something. So obviously, for people who are not backpackers, it's impossible to carry 27 days worth (laughs) of gear and supply with you. So what you do is you have like kind of checkpoints along the route where you drop off these containers or you drop off other supplies. So usually you just have a quick come down a side trail into a tiny little town, pick that up and go straight back up into the mountains. Keep going. Yes, exactly. So by the time everything's done, it's the afternoon. I don't remember, like three o'clock or something. Oh, and I was so meticulous on my planning of where exactly we were going to be every day. I had this printout of the map, like 30 pages with all my little notes and scribbles and whatever. Where were I? planned where are we going to paint even like it was ridiculous wow and we show up to the permit place and they want to know and I left it in the car I was like oh let me go get it and he was just like whatever I don't care here's our pretend schedule we'll just print out and I was like but but I planned it (laughs) you don't understand you don't understand and so I had two or three variations of what our first day was going to be And we, I can't remember what we decided if we were going to do my very least stressful or the runner up. I think we were going for like five miles or something that day. Mm -hmm. But this is straight up Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the lower 48. Crazy. So the first bit we hiked with his brother and We went for a little while and then he told us, all right, it's been a quarter mile. I'm going to head back. I still have to drive all the way back to LA, blah, blah, blah. We're like just huge grins on our face. Like whatever. Okay. La-di-da. This is going to be so much fun. And then we were going forever and ever and ever. And it was just like, are you sure that was a quarter mile? Because we aren't seeing any of the signs that we've even gone one mile At this point, like way long after, um, we were moving so slow and it was hard to like figure out like, you know, okay, so the the trail bent in this way. Are we at the campsite or all of a sudden realizing my map wasn't helping us all that much and being humbled very quickly by what hiking up a mountain with these outrageous backpacks meant Do you know how much your backpacks weighed? Did you weigh them? (laughs) I'm embarrassed to say. I gotta hear this. (laughs) I was toting 45 pounds. Oh my god. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, but even a normal backpacking situation with just your survival gear, like if you go bare minimum... And then you add all your painting gear and paints are heavy. Like they're amazingly heavy. Oil paints. Yeah. It was a very kind of cool experience planning for the whole trip and just realizing that like in my life as an artist, there was just like litters of paper towel. I needed a huge space. I needed so many things. And then like planning for this and paring down sort of like the Mary Kondo method that's going on like does this bring you joy right but instead it's more like looking at every item and just being like do I need you or like can I pare you down in some way can you be replaced by something else exactly and it was really exciting it was like being able to live with so much more intention you know the last couple of days I was just you know, so proud of myself for paring down so much to be like comparable or even better than the average backpackers weight that 
I was like, all right, at this point, you know, I can add one more paint or, or whatever. All these little things sort of added up that brought me to a bit of an excessive weight. I regretted that pretty quickly. <laughs> I bet. And especially since you're starting at Mount Whitney, which, you know, a lot of people will train for a long time just to hike back up that and come back down. Yes, because what you don't learn in Texas is that altitude mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a thing. affects you. It's a thing. It's really a thing. It was quite the humbling start just from that like first two and a half miles when we started to when we were setting up camp. Oh my goodness. We were humbled. (laughs) (laughs) Looking back on the trip now, can you, I mean, you're doing such an amazing job of putting yourself right back into that place that you were when you started, but I'm kind of curious, what were some of the biggest surprises out of the trip? Like things that you expected to happen that didn't, or were totally completely different, like those first two and a half miles. First of all, we really came face to face with how crazy our idea was while we were hiking because in our comfortable day-to-day lives where we get food from a grocery store and we sleep on a bed and we have AC and heating, we still couldn't go and do our plein air paintings. But now, (laughs) now we're carrying these backpacks that were almost too heavy to actually carry for both of us going in the Sierra Nevadas in the altitude, in the weather, eating terrible food, sleeping on the dirt, like in the freezing cold. It was so cold at night. And then somehow plain air painting (laughs) through that was, wow, it was so hard. And (laughs) luckily everyone you know, that wasn't hard for anyone to believe. So we got a lot of praise through the trip when people would see us painting. They'd be like, what are you doing? You carried that? Right. Or or even we were so overextended that we were pretty obvious at all points throughout the trip. People would pass us by, of course, because we were going so slow. And we had like, our Prashad boxes and these extra boxes to like hold our canvases in and our turp jars swinging around and all these things kind of hanging off of our giant. So people were constantly like, who are you? What are you doing? So it was conversation after conversation. It was really funny. I bet. Because, uh, you know, again, just to put it into context for people who don't backpack at all, like people who do the Pacific Crest Trail or the John Muir Trail, they do things like cut off the end of their toothbrush to make it a little bit lighter. So they are like extremely conscious of every ounce that goes into a backpack. (laughs) And then you've got your like hardcore backpackers who, I don't know how to phrase this, but to have things hanging off of your backpack and jiggling (laughs) around is just like that culture. You don't do that. And part of it is just things get caught, things get lost. It's just not taking care of your gear. And when you're that pared down, if anything falls off, it could be disastrous. So that's sort of like the mindset of the people that you're running into. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. We brought humor to many lives on I'm that I'm sure. <laughs> I am so sure. You know, and I'm just imagining the other thing about about backpacking is you're carrying your home and everything on your back. So you mentioned that when you are living in your own home, you have all those conveniences of being in a home and stores and air conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're out there, you're hiking all day. So physically, you're getting exhausted. And then you have to set up your home that you're going to sleep in, you've got to set up the either the tent or the place that you're going to sleep in. And then you have to set up your kitchen. And then you have to cook food off of a tiny little stove. So everything that like normally just like, okay, I'll grab a burger, or let me just open the fridge and grab something quick to eat, you have to prepare everything. (laughs) So cooking meals is not a small thing. Yeah, everything was a thing and everything was a challenge because Mark and I 
are very similar in our characters, both artists. And so both have the same weaknesses and planning is one of them. So this like just, it was amazing. It really like pushed us out of our comfort zone to, to do all those things. And this is sort of a thing in general when you're plein air painting, right? Because you, at least to some degree, because you pack all the things that you need and you go out into the elements and you set up and you are at the mercy of the changing of the light, the changing of the weather, the wind, whether or not you knock over your turp jar, if you forget your paint brushes, like whatever, right? That's true in, in plain air painting in general. But when you add the element of backpacking, and especially when you add the element of through hiking, where you're going for an, a long period of time without access to, oh, let me just hit the store or whatever, so many more things happened everything broke it was outrageous i'm not sure if i can even remember everything but let's see here the water filters that we bought to filter our water broke both of them we brought two they both broke um we brought solar chargers to power our phones which was our only point for reference like taking photos was constantly not working. Our phones were dead all the time. Mark's glasses broke. His tripod broke. My Peshad box broke. Um, his air mattress broke. <laughs> you had an air mattress? <laughs> I mean, sorry, not air mattress, but... um, no, The sleeping pad? Sleep- like one of those... Blow- okay, pad. okay. I was like, whoa, you guys are insane. <laughs> I'm going to bring my air mattress and my down pillows and a comforter. worth it. (laughs) No. So for when you're sleeping, you either have those foam ones or the ones that you blow up. We both brought the blow up ones and his (laughs) broke, (laughs) which um, wasn't good. It was quite the challenge. And so, and then, you know, like paintings falling in the dirt or like also maybe with the altitude or the cold or a combination of both. I don't know. The paints weren't drying either. Anyway, so it was very frustrating, but it was kind of awesome in that it like really challenged us and our our grit, I guess, to go from like needing everything to be just right and our studio's light to be just right and whatever to going through everything that was like thrown at us and still make a painting was kind of crazy and kind of awesome to say we did it. Yeah, completely. I mean, yeah. I mean, I wanted to make sure we painted the picture of exactly what it is like to be out there backpacking, because I think it's easy if you don't backpack to sort of like, Oh, wow, wow, that must have been really hard. You walked a long time, you know, (laughs) but really understanding what actually happens out there. So how many, how many paintings did you guys end up doing over the throughout that time that you were there? Again, pie in the sky ideas of what we would really do. We brought the materials to paint maybe 30 paintings leading up to the trip. Yeah, I brought enough for, I think we compromised at like 30 paintings. I kind of wanted way more than that. I think I might have brought more than that. I'm not sure because we added paint supplies into each resupply bucket as well. And, uh, what we did, maybe closer to 12. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Which was <laughs> way less than we wanted, but so outrageously challenging. <laughs> so you had this intense schedule for yourself. How did that work out? We did not stick to it. So like I said, we were moving a turtle pace. From dealing with the altitude, dealing with our backpacks, dealing with the time spent to paint, we were going quite slow. And so ideally, or originally, I had those zero days that were marked in like, okay, we're going to spend one day here, not travel at all, just paint, blah, blah, blah. I had all those in there. That never happened. And everything, it went from 
really pushing ourselves to, you know, a little bit less. So we started out waking up at like 5 a.m. every day. And then we it was very cold in the morning. Often like everything was covered in in ice and stuff when we would wake up. And um, we didn't plan to cook for breakfast. We just had cold muesli where we would just um, soak muesli in water. So what we would do is we'd be freezing cold. We'd wake up at five, pack everything up and just hike until the sun came up and we were warm. Yeah. So we'd pour water into the muesli and then um, paint in the morning, eat our breakfast and then go off. Or if we weren't liking the scenery or something like that, then maybe we would just eat the muesli, take a minute to breathe, keep going. And we just kind of like find something along the way, generally in the mornings and evenings, but sometimes not. And just spend like an hour or something painting. So we'd kind of like sneak it into our days, basically, instead of like devoting a day. Right, right. That makes sense. I can absolutely picture what's happening because like I've been in those situations, like I've been there backpacking out in the middle of nowhere, not, not with a sketchbook and a uh, gouache was about the extent of what I decided that I would take with me. So You're I am smart. smart. <laughs> so I'm imagining all of this and just going like, Oh my, like at that point, because you're physically so tired and you're out in the elements all the time and it's cold or it's hot and you got bugs and you got this and after a while, I would imagine that the last thing you want to do is paint. Yeah, so it was somewhere between the last thing we wanted to do and the only thing we wanted to do. <laughs> right. I don't want to walk anymore. Yeah, and it was very rarely were we on the same page about that. There was good and bad about being together. I would say definitely mostly good. There was sort of this forced accountability being on the trail and being with someone, uh, you can't just decide like, oh, I'm not going to hike today or whatever. Like you only have so much food with you. You have to get to the next checkpoint, right? So there was that forced accountability on the trail. And then also that element that I was missing being in a studio by myself, having Mark with me was also this accountability that we both really needed. And it was always the case where um, before each painting, one of us was coaching the other one. Like, you know, one of us wanted to paint, the other one didn't. And so it was great. Like, we needed each other to have that accountability that we we had lost in our day-to-day life. Perfect. It just seems to work out that way usually, right? When one person is kind of in a trough, the other person is not in the trough and can pull them out. I was about to say on a peak, but maybe it's not so high. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe just on a, you know, a couple feet up, <laughs> just a little bit in a better mind frame or physical exhaustion level than the other one and can kind of like, come on, we can do it. So looking back now, what are some of the things that you took from that experience and brought into your studio at home now? For one, and this is sort of going back to that quote that I paraphrased about needing to live life to have life in your paintings. I have actually, landscapes always have been a struggle for me. I tend more towards portraits and I think maybe partly because the school I went to was focused on portraits so it's just where I was comfortable with and I was used to those sort of more controlled settings of painting someone inside or by a window or something like that where so much more is predictable or like the things that you learn from each painting apply directly to your next painting and with landscape that's not as much the case because there's so many more variables, right? But I was trying to approach landscape the same way that I was approaching these indoor portraits where I would be like, ah, the shadows are more purple or something like this. Or, But really it was just what the light was doing in that moment 
that time of day, that whatever, all these variables that were going on that doesn't necessarily fit for, you know, another time of day or something like that. And it's an incredible, it's a meditative thing where you are really one, I guess, with your environment, like you really have to see what's out there instead of having these preconceived ideas of how the light's going to work. And so the process of painting outside, of course, is a great practice towards that. But actually the entire 27 days that I was out there, (laughs) that we were both out there wondering why we were doing this, was this incredibly valuable experience as an artist because I was watching light all day long, right? Every day I was seeing how how the light moved from the early morning through the afternoon, through the evening, watching how things are receding, all these like elements that were somehow escaping me for so long, I was forced to observe day in and day out. And it was incredibly valuable in that sense. So that was definitely a really big take home. And also often I have to work from photos, right? As an artist, I no longer can afford models, for example. That's another thing about being in school, right? They're just there for you. (laughs) Exactly. Which is awesome. Painting from life is awesome and is not something that I have the luxury of doing quite as often anymore. And photos have their place, right? Of course, in the process of making art, but they are a step removed from that experience, from that subject that you're painting. And of course, in this body of work for this upcoming show, it's from the planar sketches, but also from photos that we were taking or a combination of the two. So we're still looking at these photos. But um, when I look at them, I'm remembering all these experiences because it's not just a photo, right? It's 27 days worth of experiences that I kind of relive when I look at these photos and remember those moments. And so it's really transformed that process where it's not just a photo anymore. You have the memory to work from. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I think that is so important with painting and it takes a while and it takes an experience like you had where you are immersed in this experience and you're memorizing, you're taking mental notes and memorizing what you see so that when you're back in the studio, you can apply it and it's part of your experience. It's part of the intuition that you use when you're painting and it's part of the visual memory Um, library, let's call it, that you have access to when you come back to your studio. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So incredible. Like, this is so much fun talking about this stuff. And it's (laughs) making me want to go backpacking so badly. But um, share with people where they can see your work and what you have coming up. You can see my work on my personal website, which is TheresMorgan.com. Um, Mark and I also created a collaboration, I guess, endeavor called Brush Miles, which you can see on BrushMiles.com, where we are trying to create more experiences like this in the future. So this is sort of like the first of many. Where's your show coming up at? Yes. So we're also doing a two-person show based on the trip at 625 Sutter Gallery in San Francisco, March 7th. Wonderful. Therese, thank you so much for this. That was a lot of fun. And like (laughs) I said, completely, it's so fascinating and so much fun to hear how you and Mark approached this and what you got out of it. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you, Andres. It was great talking. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Painter podcast with Therese Morgan. Thank you so much to Therese for sharing her story. You can see pictures from her trip, images of her work, and links to connect with Therese in the show notes for this episode. Just go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab. A big thank you and much gratitude goes out to some very special people who make this podcast possible. 
Thank you so much to Elizabeth Liebert, David Gorski, Ruth Kalb, Karen Conaway, Hannah Lake, Corin Salashka, Susan Cartledge, Ronald Chavez, Suzanne Vincenze, Kristen Kronick, Simon Austin, Shirley Williams, Deborah Bird, Danielle McDonald, Gail Root, Alexis Redden, Gabrielle McDermott, Leslie Gerhardt, Barry Koplowitz, Robin Delaney, Joy Holcomb, Sylvia Bailey, Kathy Beeler, Victoria Eisenberg, and Julie Snydel. Your contributions keep the lights on and help pay for the editors and licensing and all the maintenance costs that go into making this podcast available for everyone. Thank you so very much. Lastly, just a quick reminder that Savvy Painter will now be every other week. So until next time, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thanks so much for listening.